of Critical Theory and Social Justice at Occidental College. Um, I'm Professor Caroline Heldman, and I am joined today by the two colleagues who are co-hosting this series with me, Dr. Mary Christianakis, who is our department chair, uh, and Professor Mosum Dulat, who uh, the running hills that he, he runs long distance in the background. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the series before we jump into our esteemed speaker today. Uh, we are focusing on current and pressing events. This is a speaker series that we plan to continue um, indefinitely. But this summer, we're focusing on two primary things. The first is the COVID-19 pandemic and its far-reaching social, political, and economic effects. Uh, the second theme is political violence, and in particular, the violence of U.S. police forces against Black people and its deep and broad roots in U.S. society and history. To this end, uh, next week we have a very special guest. Uh, we'll, we will host Josh Marshall, who's the founder of the influential political news and investigative journalism site, uh, Talking Points Memo. He is going to discuss the 2020 election in light of political corruption and specifically his view uh, from New York City of police violence and the pandemic. If you would like to uh, know more about this uh, speaker series, registration links are available for all of them at oxy.edu matrix. And please note that we're using the webinar format. That means you can submit questions at any time and we'll do a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So let me jump into our speaker for today. Anastasios uh, Angelopoulos is a PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley. His research focus includes theoretical machine learning with applications in vision and healthcare. He also works on computational imaging and non-traditional sensors for medical applications. Anastasios is co has co-funded a telemedicine company uh, and he currently leads an international space station study on space-induced blindness. Uh, but I'm not done yet. Uh, Anastasios was awarded a National Science Foundation Graduate Fellow uh, Research Fellowship, a Berkeley Fellowship, and when he attended Stanford as an undergraduate, he was a National Scholar and the only electrical engineer to win the Terman Award, Phi Beta Kappa, Tau Beta Pi, and Departmental uh, Distinction Awards. In his spare time, Anastasios was also a member of the U.S. national debate team, where he won three national championships and placed 10th in the world. So with no further ado, he is going to talk to us about uh, dark data and COVID-19. Welcome, Anastasios. Hi, guys. I'm going to share my screen here, so I want you to tell me if you see what I'm doing. All right. Can you see this screen, everybody? Yes, no? Yes. Great. Okay. So, the title of this talk is Dark Data in COVID-19. I did this work jointly with a few of my collaborators at Berkeley. Um, and there's a recent article out in the Harvard Data Science Review that summarizes our findings. Um, but I'm just going to go through uh, a couple different topics with you. The first thing that we might want to define is this term dark data. So what do I mean when I say there's a lot of dark data being thrown around with COVID-19. Well, really, I mean that the data is extremely low quality, but there's a lot of it. So there's a lot of data and it's tough to see what it's actually telling us. But nonetheless, we need to learn from the data anyway. And the reasons we need to learn from the data are because, first of all, we need to do some accounting. We need to look in the past and ask the question, what has already happened? So for example, where has the disease spread? some geographic notion of prevalence might be useful for us. Another question we might ask is how many people have already been infected or at any given time, which people were infected? And then we'd, all, we'd also want to know a question like how many people have died from the disease? And we need to learn that all from surveillance data, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And the reason why we want to know this accounting is not just you know, for historical reasons, but also so that we can predict some stuff about the future within reason. So one of the things we might want to predict, for example, is what is the probability? So this is a probability symbol and we're gonna see it again. And the way you read the sentence is, what's the probability of infection given exposure? So if you get exposed to somebody who has COVID-19, what's the probability that you then get infected? 
So this is related to this number R naught that you might have seen before, which is the reproductive number of the disease. And it's also related to the number of people infected in the population. And then another thing you might want to know is what is the probability of death given infection? So if you get infected, what's the probability that you then die from that infection? And then how do we use these numbers to inform resource allocation and public policy decisions? So for example, you know, if people are dying in a certain geographic area more often than others, or if they're being put on ventilators in that geographic area more often than others, then we might want to allocate healthcare workers to that geographic area um, at higher rates, for example. In this talk, you know, it's obviously impossible to go through all of these topics. So I'm mostly gonna focus on this quantity, the probability of death given infection. And that's also what we focus on in our article. And then you can extrapolate from that a little bit of sort of the philosophy of the way that I'm gonna be talking about these topics to other issues. And one question that you might ask, the first question is, do these quantities exist? Do they even exist as quantities, as fixed numbers, or are they random? And by random, I mean, are they functions of the population that you end up sampling? Are they functions of time? Are they functions of race and age? Are they functions of, you know, under ascertainment? And the answer, of course, we're going to find out is yes, and we're going to explain sort of exactly why that's true. So in this introductory section of the presentation, which I expect to take probably around 30 minutes, um, I have three goals for you. The first is I want you at the end of this to understand what the case fatality rate is. The case fatality rate is a measure of, you know, how many people are dying from the disease. And I also want you to understand why we need to estimate it. Why don't we just sort of know this number magically off, you know, by just dividing two numbers, dividing deaths by cases. The second thing I want you to understand is why all CFR estimators based on the data that we currently have are going to be biased and in what way and in what direction those biases are gonna be going. And then in the third section, we're gonna talk about how we address those biases. So what are some strategies that we can arrive at a number that we halfway believe in? Uh, in order to inform public policy decisions. And so there's gonna be an emotional trajectory to this talk. The emotional trajectory is at the beginning. This is you now, you're just, you know, you're feeling okay. And then in section one, you know, maybe you feel pretty good about what you're understanding. And then in section two, you're gonna realize, oh my God, this is a total mess. And there's a lot of biases that we need to account for and there's pretty much no way we can handle all of them. And then in section three, I'm gonna give you some strategies for how we might with better data collection and with estimation strategies that are guided by data science and medicine, uh, be able to achieve some understanding of these quantities and wrap our heads around them in order to make the useful decisions that we might want to make in the world. Okay, section one, what's the case fatality rate and why is it random? So case fatality rate actually has a really simple definition. This is how it's defined. So this operator is the definition operator. You'll see it a few times. Case fatality rate is defined as the proportion i.e. the fraction, of fatal cases. So this seems like a pretty straightforward definition. It's a measure of disease risk, right? And by that, I mean, what's the risk that you are a fatality given that you're a case? And it's useful for resource allocation like we've talked about. But actually, one level deeper, this term is totally ambiguous. It's extremely difficult to define. And the reason is because First of all, it depends on the definition of the word cases. So how can we define cases? One way that we can define cases is if you're a lab confirmed case, i.e. if you've gotten a blood sample, it's gone to you know, Quest Diagnostics or whatever, and it comes back saying this person has COVID-19 because they've done a PCR assay, a polymerase chain reaction assay. Okay, another definition might be that the case is symptom-based. So a doctor sees you know, this person has a dry cough, Therefore, they have COVID-19. So that's how you would make a symptom-based diagnosis. And then the third definition is a little bit more aspirational in the sense that we'd be including all infections, known and unknown. So there's a bunch of people in the wild that are asymptomatic. And that population might be larger than the population that we actually measure, the known people who are lab-confirmed and symptom-based diagnoses. In this talk, I'm generally going to consider cases to be all infections, because what we really care about is the probability that you die given you're infected, 
not the probability that you die given you're diagnosed. And so that's going to be a key distinction that we make later on. Another word that might seem clear but actually isn't is the word fatal. And the reason it's unclear is, there's be, is because there's a whole se uh, spectrum of ways that people can die with COVID-19 as opposed to because of or due to COVID-19. So, you know, on one side of the spectrum, you have deaths that are totally unrelated to COVID-19, but occur to people who are COVID-19 positive. So something like somebody's COVID positive, but they fall down and they die from that fall. So obviously that shouldn't be counted in our death count. But then you have people in the middle who might have comorbidities, for example, and die due to a combination of the comorbidity and due to COVID-19. And then you have deaths that are directly attributable to COVID-19. And how you count these deaths in the middle, which might be a lot of deaths, it's kind of uh, you know, unclear. So, you know, as I said, I'm gonna consider the aspirational definition. And we're gonna go forth in mind, uh, keeping in mind these uh, potential ambiguities in definition. So another question you might ask is, what's data? What's the data that we have in order to estimate this quantity? And the data that we have in general, the most plentiful and the most commonly reported on source of data is surveillance data. So surveillance data is data taken from counties at the county level inside the United States where people are reporting raw counts of the number of cases. So that's the number of cases, the number of deaths, D, and potentially even the number of recoveries, although that number is more rare within the United States than it is in other countries. And so this axis is time, and this is total number of cases, recoveries, and deaths. So this is called surveillance data. The reason is because the government collects this data from hospitals where people go in because probably they're sick, and then a hospital report is filed. The hospital collects all those hospital reports and then reports them to the government every so often. Okay, at this point, you're probably asking the question, why isn't the case fatality rate just the number of deaths divided by the number of cases? It seems totally reasonable given that the case fatality rate is defined as the proportion of fatal cases. But remember this aspirational definition here. The answer to this question is because there's systematic data set bias that affects both the number of deaths and the number of cases. So because of the way that surveillance data is collected, both of these numbers are wrong. And so if you take the naive estimator of the case fatality rate, we're gonna to refer to this over and over again, the naive estimator, E naive, which is the number of deaths, sorry, I just erased that, the number of deaths divided by the number of cases, then you're going to include the systematic data set bias. And that has sort of unpredictable and sometimes unknowable effects. And so that means our numbers can be wrong. So in real life, you know, the case fatality rate today, if you go to Johns Hopkins University, their little data set, it's 5.2%. But that's a really, really inflated number. And we know that to be true right now, but we don't know how inflated it is. It's probably around, 10x, an order of magnitude inflated within, you know, two, two times. So that brings us to the section, second section. Why are all these case fatality estimates biased? And the answer is, as you might imagine from what I just said, because the data is biased. So one question you might ask would be, how would you collect perfect data? What would we have in the ideal world? And in the ideal world, we would have the gold standard, which all statisticians are looking for, which is randomized data. Randomized data means I go out into the world and pick people that I have no idea anything about them, sort of totally randomly, you know, off the street. And then I make my estimates based on the data that I collect from them. So I would go out and, you know, magically, if I could ran like with a random number generator, randomly select people from a city, and then test those people and then come back with an estimate of the case fatality rate for you, that estimate would be unbiased because the data would be collected in a randomized way. But we have a problem, which is that in survey sampling or in surveillance data, like we talked about before, the variable that we are looking for, which is the case fatality rate, CFR, is correlated with our sampling strategy. So instead of having randomized data, we actually have structured non-randomness. In other words, the data that we're getting 
is correlated with the people that we end up testing. And the reason why this might be true is because, you know, obviously people only go in to get tested when they have symptoms or preferentially go in to get tested when they have symptoms. And so severe cases of COVID-19 are more likely to get tested. Another reason why there's this correlation, and we know this correlation exists, is because for a long time and in a lot of nations, tests were super scarce. And so the government was reserving these tests for people that had severe cases of COVID-19 in order to be able to diagnose them with COVID-19 and therefore treat them. So we know that this correlation exists. And unfortunately, it means that our estimators are going to be really, really bad. So there's a statistician named Xiaoli Meng at Harvard who published this identity a few years ago that deals with the butterfly effect. So in this case, the butterfly effect, which means you, know, you have a small quantity that has huge effects on your estimator, applies to the correlation between your sampling and the variable you're trying to estimate. In other words, a tiny correlation can have a huge effect on the naive estimator. And this actually happens in real life. It's not just a mathematical equation. In New York, for example, in early April, we were testing around 10,000 people a day. But if you assume that this correlation between the people that we were sampling and the actual data that we collected was 0.05, which is a tiny number, what you get is that 10,000 people per day tested in New York is equivalent to 20 people per day collected via random sampling. In other words, we have 99.8% of our samples gone. Our effective sample size is 0.2% of what it should be if we were doing it random, randomly. In other words, if we were to collect 100 random samples a day in New York without this correlation, it'd be five times better than collecting 10,000 people a day with the regular surveillance mechanisms that we're using, at least for the purpose of estimating prevalence, which is what Xiaoli Ming was talking about. Another way of saying this is that compensating for quality of data with quantity is a doomed game. And the reason why, for those people that are more interested in the math, is because if you, are, if you have this correlation between the sampling and the data, then the whole population of New York is affecting the error of your estimator. So the error of your estimator is proportional to the whole population of New York City. New York City. And so there's a paper called Statistical Paradises and Paradoxes in Big Data that you should look to for more information about that. And the story for case fatality rates actually even worse. So here's a picture. This picture is called the graphical model in statistics. And you should think about this as a flow chart. In other words, somebody starts off as being susceptible to COVID-19, then they become exposed to COVID-19 because they come in contact with somebody who has it. And then with some probability, this happens. And then with some probability, they either become an asymptomatic carrier or they become symptomatic. So they might have symptoms because of the flu or they might have symptoms because of COVID or they might have symptoms of the flu, but they're also infected with COVID, right? So there's many ways somebody can become symptomatic. If you look at this diagram, each arrow here, you can think of each arrow as a probability. Specifically, each arrow is a conditional probability of being, for example, exposed given you're susceptible. So that's this arrow. Or this arrow is the probability that you become an asymptomatic carrier given you're exposed. So that's the way graphical models work. The issue here is that each arrow in this model, which is not comprehensive, but you know, is pretty detailed, comes with a potential bias that may be huge. So here's some examples. In our paper, we categorize these biases as coming from one of five sources, either under ascertainment of mild cases, which means only severe cases are getting diagnosed in the hospital, time lags, which means you know, there's a time lag between, for example, when you die and when you get counted as a case, Interventions, which are things like the government tells you to wear masks one week but not the other. Population characteristics like age, sex, race, etc. And also imperfect reporting and attribution, which is governments, for example, misreporting cases. And it turns out we have evidence that all of these biases are super serious. So if you look specifically at under ascertainment of mild cases, 
In April, there was a serology study in New York. Serology means they were looking for you know, little pieces of the virus in your blood, in your serum, which is you know, everything except for your red blood cells. And that way they can tell if you ever have the disease. And in April, serology in New York suggested that there was a 21.2% prevalence of COVID-19 in New York, i.e. 21.2% of New Yorkers had at some point had coronavirus. But also, you know, if you took the population of New York, which is something like 8.3 million people, something like that, and you multiply that by 21.2%, you get that uh, 1.76 million individuals in New York should have been infected with coronavirus. But if you look at the count that's being reported by surveillance data, surveillance data says there's 213,000 confirmed cases. So, you know, that's a factor of like eight difference in the number of cases that we should be measuring versus the number of cases that we are. So that's a strong suggestion that under ascertainment of mild cases is huge. It's an eightfold bias, which means that E-naive is going to be biased upwards by eight, eight times at least. And, you know, another example is population characteristics. So, you know, we're in a critical theory and social justice seminar, so we might as well mention stuff like, you know, race or age, which are population characteristics that are very important. So let me try to zoom in here. If you look at the ratio of the case fatality rate, and this is from Brookings, if you look at the ratio of the case fatality rate of people that are ages 35 to 44, between black people and white people within the United States, you get a 10x case fatality rate. So black people are 10 times more likely, given that data, in the age range 35 to 44, to die from coronavirus, given that they are infected from it. And for Hispanic people and Latinos, it's eight times. And then if you take all ages, it's four times or 25 times. So why do these biases exist? Is it because we're sampling our data incorrectly? Or is it because of other comorbidities that might be more common in black people or Hispanic and Latino people than white people? Or is it because black people and Hispanic and Latino people are getting worse access to healthcare? Or is it because um, you know, those people go to the hospital and they're not taken seriously, they're not diagnosed with COVID and then only the fatal ones are counted in the case fatality rate estimation. So all of those things might be true and we don't really know. So serious inquiry has to be made on that front. And then the same thing is true in age. So in age, you have a huge distinction between people that are 65 and older that have a case fatality of 5.6%, and then those that are 10 to 19 that are you know, a fraction of 1%. Imperfect reporting and attribution also has a huge effect. So there was a 600% increase in Chinese cases in February 12th for, you know, because of an inconsistent case definition. And also on Friday, April 17th, the case count in Wuhan went up 50%. And the reason the government claims that that happened is because doctors were too busy to report cases. And the issue here is that all of these biases partially cancel. So even if we could correct for under ascertainment of mild cases, for example, using this prevalence data, we might not want to do that. Since all of these biases might be in different directions, which means that correcting one might mean that you get a worse estimator at the end of the day. So even though we know some of this information, we might not want to integrate it, or it's not clear that integrating it is going to result in a better answer. So let's explore this with a simple example. Let's say we know the CFR. The CFR is P. In a perfect situation, we expect the naive estimator to be P. So this little thing is a mathematical symbol, meaning the expectation operator. It just means the mean of the naive estimator, or you know, if we were to repeat history a million times, the naive estimator would on average be the case fatality rate. So this is, you should read this as we expect the, case, the, the naive estimator to be the true case fatality rate. But now let's assume there's a time lag. Let's assume that C is rising rapidly. In other words, the number of cases is growing but the number of deaths is not growing yet because people have not had time to experience fatality yet. Then the naive estimate, we would expect it to be the case fatality rate divided by some positive constant, i.e. the case fatality rate is lower than it should be because D is too low. So there's some bias introduced by the time lag. 
Okay, so keep that in your back pocket. But now assume that we also have under ascertainment of mild cases like we talked about in New York. That would mean that the number of deaths is too large. And it's too large by fa positive factor B2, which is greater than one. So now we expect E naive, which is deaths divided by cases, to be equal to not just the case fatality rate over, over B1, but B2 over B1 times the case fatality rate. In other words, both of these constants are positive, so they cancel each other out. And if you were to remove B1, that might make the naive estimator closer to P in the end. And in sort of the ridiculous case where B1 is equal to B2, these biases totally cancel each other out because this is equal to one. And E naive is perfect, despite the fact that it has two biases because those biases help us by canceling each other out. And unfortunately, people made this exact mistake early on in the pandemic. So there was, for example, a paper published in The Lancet called Real Estimates of the COVID-19 Case Fatality Rate. It was called something like that. It's not the exact title. Where they tried to, collect, to correct for time lags. And the way they did that is by basically, you know, delaying the number of cases. So taking the number of cases from a few days ago when we've had time to observe all the deaths. But the problem is that that probably leads to a worse estimate because of the exact reason I'm talking about here, which is the under ascertainment bias is no longer being canceled. And so they have no proof that this is a better estimator. In our paper, we actually have derived sort of theoretically the sufficient condition under which the naive estimator is unbiased. So in other words, we can tell you sort of the exact mathematical relationship between the covariance of the people who die and the people that we diagnose and whether or not this estimator is biased, at least in a simple mathematical setting, we can tell you that. So if you define Q to be the reporting rate, i.e. how many people you know, are reporting to our survey or to our surveillance study, and R to be the covariance between death and diagnosis, i.e. this value that I've been talking about for the whole time, uh, the number of the covariance between the people that we sample and the people that we're looking for, which is fatalities, then what are the conditions for the naive estimator is equal to P? And so there's an equation here, which I don't want you to be afraid of, because you only need eighth grade algebra to understand this equation. So you have this first term, which is, the, which is the covariance term. This is the bias, which we want to remove, divided by Q. And Q is between 0 and 1, so Q can only make R bigger. This term is the price that we get for this correlation that I've been talking about. We want this to be equal to 0 because we want to have as close to random sampling as possible. And then this term is the price of underreporting. So if Q is large, this thing is going to bias us. But the good thing is that there's this N term in the top. So N is the number of samples that we're going to collect. And as N grows, this is an exponential. So this whole thing is going to disappear pretty quickly. So actually, we don't care too much about having you know, a small amount of samples or a long, large amount of underreporting, because this term is going to pretty quickly go to 0. And in our paper, we show that if you have N equals 66, then you're going to be pretty good here. So this means basically that if this term is large, then we're screwed. And unfortunately, we have, we have evidence that given our current sampling strategy, it is large. Not only have I been talking about this sort of for the whole talk, but also if you look at the case fatality rate today, which is 5.2%, and you also take sort of corrected estimators that people think are closer to the truth without necessarily believing it, like the case fatality rate equals 0.5%, then R over Q would be at least 4.7. So R over Q, in this case, is much, much larger than the case fatality rate. And so our signal is mostly bias. In other words, the estimates that we get from the 5.2% are mostly bias. And we need to find ways to correct for them. And statisticians are finding ways to correct the, for them. But this brings me to section three, which is how do you fix bias? Fixing bias is not just something that you can do with an estimator. In fact, we had a corrected estimator in our paper that we published that's sort of more mathematical. It deals with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and sampling methods. Um, but in addition to having estimators and work like that, which you know the statistics community has been on top of, we also need testing and reporting of asymptomatic and deadly cases 
to occur at the same rate. In other words, we need R equals zero. Again, I erased that, but sorry. We need R over Q equals zero. So what's one way that we can do this? Here's an idea. For brevity, let's denote P to be just a person. So here's a flow chart of a way that we can try to reduce R, the covariance between death and diagnosis. So the first step might be that we diagnose person P at the hospital. So they go to the hospital and therefore they have a covariance between their diagnosis and their symptoms because they probably go to the hospital because they're sick. So we throw out the data from P. But then we look to all of the recent contacts of P. So we contact trace P and we try to re reach out to those contacts before that they get symptoms. And then we ask them to, to commit to getting tested. So we ask them to commit to getting tested before they get symptoms. And then we test them after one incubation period of the virus, which is around four to, five day, four to five days. And we follow up after a few weeks for an outcome of whether or not they died or whether or not they had serious symptoms. In the process, we should keep the maximum granularity that we can under sort of ethical and legal norms. And then note if there's a correlation that we can you know, recognize between people who don't respond to you know, our tests and those who end up getting symptoms. So why in this case are we getting R naught as close to zero or zero? It's because patients don't know yet if they enroll, if they actually have symptoms. And so if you're very, very careful to ensure that this is true, then what are you going to get? You're going to get this picture, which is that if the case fatality rate is large, it's going to be really easy to estimate. With basically a thousand samples, which is, you know, several, like a thousand orders of magnitude lower than the number of samples that we've been collecting currently, we're going to get pretty close to the case fatality rate. And the problem gets harder as the case fatality rate decreases, simply because observing one fatality is going to be more difficult. So in that case, we might need more than 10,000 or 100,000 cases in order to you know, pin down the value of our estimator. And there's fancier things that you could do here, but this is sort of the bottom line. It's gonna make it easier for you, even in the case that death is quite rare. So what does this mean? This means the naive estimator is unbiased but it's only unbiased for the population that we're sampling. So this actually might still not quite solve our problem, although it's gonna get us you know, orders of magnitude closer to solving the, solving the issue. So an example of the way that it might not solve the problem is because, you know, let's say, let's take the, the example of black Americans, right? So we've talked about how black Americans are basically the most at-risk population inside the United States from dying from COVID. They have four times the probability of dying. They have four times the CFR. But what if they're undersampled? So what if, for example, more white people or more Latino people go to the hospital than black people and we don't have a representative sample? Well, there's a whole set of techniques in survey sampling called post stratification that can help us with this. And these techniques are used often in elections and they're pretty well developed in statistics. So in combination with using, you know, better data collection, we're going to need things like post stratification um, and corrected estimators in order to try and pin down the naive estimator or just the CFR in general. So this is the conclusion of the sort of introductory portion after which we're going to go to some questions. The first conclusion is that this idea that we're not testing enough, you know, we've been hearing this in the media all the time. It's true, but the bigger issue is that we're actually testing badly. So we're not testing enough, but we're also throwing away 99.8% of our samples because we're we're not performing our testing close to a randomized way. Um, and so there should be a huge focus on trying to collect high quality data, right? So you cannot compensate for quality with quantity or you're doomed. The second conclusion is that case fatality rate estimation is hard, but it's potentially do doable if we follow this sort of advice with data science being sort of kept in the forefront of our minds along with medicine. And the third conclusion is that when you look at COVID-19 statistics, you personally, you should think about how this data is being collected and you should think about the population you're trying to measure and whether or not it's more likely than random that the population that you're interested in measuring is going to be included in the study that you're looking at because then you're gonna get this butterfly effect. You're gonna get non-random sampling and you could potentially have huge problems with the way that that statistic is interpreted. So the details really matter and statistics is pretty easy to lie with because there's a lot of details in the things that we just talked about, even ones that I didn't mention that are in the paper. And so you might lie advertently or inadvertently, someone might lie to you.
In reality, people, people are making mistakes all the time, all the time with the data. So you should really have a critical eye on what you read. And you should try to keep specifically this butterfly effect idea in mind. And with that, I think we're good and we should open up for our questions. Thank you so much, Anastasias, for that brilliant talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in. And so folks who, who want to send in questions, we will get to all of them today, or um, perhaps it will be via email after the talk. Let's see how much time we have. Uh, the first question for you, uh, playing around with the data, what happens to e-naive if the robustness, the sensitivity and specificity of a, seri uh, of a serology test is less than say 90%? How impactful is that? Okay, this is a great question and I'm actually gonna share my screen again because this is something that's worth explaining um, in detail. So, The question is basically, what if serological tests have a high, let's say, um, false discovery rate? So we discover that somebody has COVID-19 with something like 99%. Sorry, uh, we falsely discover that somebody has COVID-19, you know, 1% of the time. So this might seem like a null number. You, you might be thinking, oh, if the false discovery rate's 1%, you know, what's the big deal? Well, the issue is if the number of people that have COVID-19 is um, super, super low. So if only, you know, 1% of the population has COVID-19 and your population is quite large. So you have, you know, 10 million people out in the population, but only 100K actually have COVID, then what are you getting? you're getting that the number of false discoveries may be on the same order of magnitude or even outweigh the number of true samples that you're going to get. So if you test 10 million people with a false discovery rate of 100%, then you're gonna get 100,000 false discoveries of COVID. And then if you get all of these right, even if you get all of these right, then the number, the prevalence is going to be double what, you, what it should be. So it's gonna be biased by a factor of two, which is terrible. So how does that affect the naive estimator? Well, that means that D is unaffected, but C is, you know, let's say at least a factor of two, higher. So it's gonna be biased down by a factor of one half, which means we're gonna think that COVID is twice as safe as it is, or half as deadly as it should be. And the bigger issue is that this value is actually not 1%. This value is higher. It's more like, you know, 2 or 3%. And there's a confidence interval around this. So, you know, depending on the test, that confidence interval might be like, you know, 90, 95% to 100%. And so in the worst case, you might have a prevalence being multiplied by 6 or 5. I don't know if I've done that right. 6. Six, that's right. Um, so that's how it would affect it. It's actually a huge problem and seemingly small errors can result in huge issues with uh, estimation. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, what base, so you've answered this, but maybe if you can just boil it down. If someone is looking at a COVID-19 death rate number, um, what are the basic questions they need to be asking of that number? Okay, um, so the first thing is you need to be asking how the data is collected, right? So is the data collected through survey sampling? If so, what subset of the survey sampling data are they taking? Um, is that subset more likely to be close to a randomized data set than sort of the whole surveillance sampling data set is? Um, and then the second thing is, you know, people do all sorts of corrections. So for example, people might be correcting for prevalence. Um, and so if they correct for prevalence, but they don't correct for anything else, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, is the correction for, for prevalence accounting for most of the bias? Or is it actually deleting the corrections of other biases that might be larger? So personally, you know, I think that probably prevalence is a large portion of the bias and 
probably correcting for it is a good thing. But then after that, you need to make sure that, you know, your confidence intervals of the prevalence that you are estimating are, you know, reasonable. And you look at both ends of the, of the spectrum. So you're not just taking a point estimate. There's a lot of uncertainty there. So you have to look at the uncertainty in the estimate. Um, and then you have to also think, you know, given what the authors have done with this data, is it possibly now underestimating the case fatality rate? So for example, if you have this issue of false discovery rate and you adjust for prevalence, but now you're adjusting for six times the prevalence of what you actually should be, well, then maybe you should, you know, take that number with a grain of salt and you should say, um, well, it's actually probably higher than this, but this is a useful lower bound. So that's the way I would look at the numbers. Thank you. Um, question from Lauren Chen. How can we randomly test the population if people who are in contact with confirmed cases are being tested for individual health and reduced spread, since this will ultimately be biased if in addition to attempts to randomly test other members of the population? So, is the, so I guess the question is, if you reach out to people and do contact tracing, so I, correct me if I misunderstand this, but if you reach out to people and do contact tracing, so you only take the people that you know you've in, you enroll uh, before they get symptoms, but then you mix that with other numbers, you're going to get a bias. And the answer is you should separate those data sets, right? You're going to get a really small data set by doing this contact tracing scheme that I have proposed. Um, but if you get a thousand people that way, you know, just a thousand, um, then you're going to get a good unbiased estimate for the particular subpopulation that you end up testing. And then you might have to do post stratification to fix that. But as long as there's no R, you're going to be okay. As long as you sort of that keep that data set in its own little pile and use it for calculations. Another question. Uh, there is a significantly difficult challenge in data collection. How effective as a solution is it to only focus on cases versus, versus case fatality rates for hospitalized persons? Do you think that data effective in addressing preventative care matters? I think. Uh, and I ask in regards particularly to steroids as preventative tools, considering there's an extremely high correlation between fatalities and severe vitamin D deficiency, a steroid or hormone, um, higher recorded susceptibility among people with asthma while maintaining a lower fatality rate, a population utilizing uh, corticosteroids, and then recent success in reducing the fatality rate in the UK through the use of the cortical steroid uh, dexamethasone. Okay. Long question. So I think the, the broader question here, um, if I understand it correctly, is whether or not case fatality rate is useful for sort of understanding the effectiveness of different interventions uh, for COVID-19. And um, so the first thing that I would say is that I'm not an expert on the particular studies or the particular interventions. So there's data analysis done in those papers that you need to look at carefully um, because the same exact issues that I'm talking about might appear in those papers, but also it might not. And the reason it might not is because if those papers are carefully selecting sort of the population that they're testing, and if the population that they test for COVID um, is sort of the same population that they've included uh, to talk about the effectiveness of their intervention, then you're probably okay. So for example, you know, randomized controlled trials are still a gold standard. And the reason why they're you know, a gold standard is because if you take a particular population and then you randomly divide them in two groups and then do your intervention, then you are actually randomizing. You're just randomizing within the initial population that you were given. And so those conclusions that you get, they're going to be valid. They're going to be valid for that initial population. Now, if you want to extrapolate that to other populations, well, then you have to make an argument about that. And maybe that needs to be a more careful argument that includes more statistical ideas. Um, but, you know, the sort of the main FDA style randomized control studies, those, those methodologies are still valid and they don't rely on surveillance data. That's the reason why they're still valid. Thank you. Um, question about colleges and universities reopening, and maybe this applies to some other institutions as well. But as you know, across the country, colleges and universities um, are taking different approaches to this. Uh, given what you know about the data and the prevalence, what you do know about COVID-19 uh, rates, do you think it's safe for colleges and universities to reopen to students in the fall? I see. So, you know, I'm not a public policy expert, but I think um, the first thing I would say is that if colleges and universities 
you know, and other institutions where people are going to be gathering together in large numbers are going to reopen. Um, that reopening needs to be really carefully guided by data science and also medicine. So the people that are in charge of, you know, so there should be test, there should be randomized testing going on in a college if they're going to reopen, right? You can't just rely on, you know, some random, you know, catching cases when they arise um, in order to, you know, figure out whether there's going to be an outbreak and whether people are safe. It needs to be very carefully thought out in terms of, you know, how do you pump the brakes on reopening so that if cases achieve some th certain threshold, well, then you've determined that it, with a randomized sample, if they reach that certain threshold, then there's some probability that actually there's a ton of people in your college that have it or that there's going to be some sort of outbreak. You need to think about that probabilistic model and you need to, you know, have something that you sort of believe in there and somebody that's an expert to, to make those decisions. You know, colleges and universities are in good place because we have a bunch of experts on campus that can help make those decisions. Um, but that, that really needs to be done. Um, and then, you know, the second thing is you have to know that there's a, uh, there's a lot of issues with AIDS, right? Your professors are the people that you're really gonna be worried about. Like, I'm not going back to Berkeley because I don't wanna kill my advisor. Because, you know, my advisor has maybe a 10% chance of dying or whatever, because he's over 65. I don't remember what the exact number is, don't quote me on that. Uh, but it's much higher than mine. Um, and so I'm not gonna be going to see him. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's gonna be a question like, how many of your faculty, or like what, what risk are you okay with imposing on your faculty? Or, you know, if you're not uh, forcing your faculty to go, to go to classes, which nobody should force their faculty to do, um, then for each individual faculty member, you have to be, you know, you have to calculate your relative risk honestly. Do you have a comorbidity, et cetera? And then if faculty members are not going to campus, then what's the point of bringing students to campus? You know, personally, I'm not going, um, but, uh, yeah, I guess that's my long form answer. Well, to follow up on that, um, given what you know about the data and prevalence rates and death rates, um, curious about your personal safety precautions. So uh, we know that we're now in California, we're in a phase where bars, salons, gyms, restaurants, other kind of uh, high risk places are open with certain guidelines, but we've seen a 69% increase in the past two days in, in the number of cases, according to imperfect numbers. Um, what are you doing? As, what am I doing? Are, are you going to these places? You're, so you're not gonna go to your college or university, just curious about your personal safety precaution plan. Yeah, so um, personally, my entire family and I are basically in quarantine. Uh, we're all working from home, which we're lucky to be able to do. You know, one of the reasons why certain groups um, have a higher, have a higher you know, prevalence or risk of dying um, is because they're in high risk jobs uh, and you know, they don't have the luxury of staying home. But I do have the luxury of staying home because I'm a graduate student. Um, so I stay home, you know, I wash my groceries off um, and I don't go to places like that. Actually, you know, you can see my hair. My hair has been cut. It was cut by my sister um, who did a pretty good job, but then you get problems like if you put my hair down, you know, there's this little thing here. So, you know, I'm not going to, salons are totally superfluous to my lifestyle um, and nobody really cares how I look. So I'm not going. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm staying home. Was that before the pandemic that salons were superfluous to your life? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They've always been. Um, a question about uh, what studies are doing it right. So what random sample studies do exist and what are the best actual estimates for case fatality rates? Okay, so I... I think, so the, the last time I really kept track of sort of the best estimates was um, maybe a month ago. I think certain estimates, uh, the, the range of estimates that I think people are looking at are, you know, from a fraction of 1%, so like 0.3% uh, to slightly above 1%. So I think that's sort of the range that people are converging on. How are people converging on that? They're, they're converging on that using, you know, the corrections that we've been talking about for prevalence along with, uh, different statistical strategies like, you know, generalized linear models, et cetera. Um, and they're trying to, or even Bayesian statistics, right? So a lot of people, one big study that's been very highly cited 
has been using Bayesian modeling to try to impose you know, outside information, you know, prior distributions on the parameters of the disease to try to estimate what the case fatality rate actually is. So, you know, that's the range that I'm thinking of. Uh, I'm not following the day by day because I know that we don't actually have a good data set. Um, as soon as we, I hear that we have a good data set, that's going to be when I think the next big leap forward in terms of what we can say about the statistics is going to be. And I think we've actually seen that and, you know, there's not been a huge case fatality rate publication recently that I know about. Someone wants to know how they can follow you and your work. Well, I have a website um, that I can link you to. I'll put it in the chat. Great. Another question. Um, everybody from national governments to online bloggers seems to have a prediction for the long-term dynamics of the pandemic and how it will evolve on a time scale of months. How do such epidemiological models work in general and how can we learn to think about them critically? Okay, so uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, I think that uh, I'm gonna screen share my iPad for that. Um, and I'm also gonna screen share my iPad because I can't figure out how to send a link to the chat. Um, do you guys actually, Caroline, have a way to, uh, Professor Heldman, sorry, do you guys have a way to um, reach out to people after the presentation and send them the link, or is that something that I should draw up here? We can certainly do that. Okay, then that's what I'm going to have you do. Thank you. Um, so the question was basically, what types of models are people using to, um, you know, make long-term predictions about COVID-19 and, you know, what should we believe about them, et cetera. Um, so there's three categories of models um, that I'm gonna write down. Um, and this should take, you know, two or three minutes to go through. The categories are generalized linear models or just statistical models, agent-based models and compartmental models. So what do you do in a generalized linear model? A generalized linear model is essentially like, you know, a generalization of curve fitting. So you've all seen, I'm gonna have my pretty colors here. You've all seen sort of like least squares curve fitting where people have a cluster of points and they fit them to a line. Well, in generalized linear models, you can do something, you know, a little bit more free. You can, for example, take logistic functions and then, you know, fit them to a time series of data here and then you can use those to predict some stuff in the future. And in fact, you can even get confidence intervals around that prediction. This is what statisticians tend to do. They tend to use generalized linear models um, because they tend to be pretty unforgiving in terms of their confidence intervals, depending on if you do them right. Um, so really, you know, if we make inferences, long-term inferences, by the way, on the, or on the time scale of months are totally, you know, out of line. Those things should just, you know, be taken with a huge grain of salt or just not reported. Um, and the reason is because we really don't know about, uh, you know, what things are going to take place in the next few months. Those might include government interventions. Those might, those might include people just, you know, deciding that the pandemic doesn't exist and going out and interacting, uh, like happens in Arizona, I guess. Um, but for the few weeks predictions, these things are okay. And the benefit of generalized linear models is that they can also give you sort of parameter estimates of things like the CFR or R0, et cetera. So people are, statisticians tend to use generalized linear models to do that. And then in epidemiology, you have agent-based models and compartmental models and agent-based models. Sorry, that was a terrible square. And agent-based models, basically what you do is, you know, you have a person and you have another person and you say, let's, let's run like, you know, let's play Sims. Sims. Let's, let's like play out a little video game and say there's a little radius around which, you know, if P1 gets too close to P2, then they get infected with some probability. And let's say these people cross paths, well then, P2 might transmit the infection to P1, and then you just sort of like simulate how people interact. You know, maybe P2 is going to work. And maybe you actually lay out this little plot so that it's the same as, you know, California. That's California. 
Um, and so you model where people go to work or whatever. And then you run that simulation a million times uh, and you try to see how things are gonna go in the future. And how do you get the estimates of things like R0? Well, you get them from generalized linear models and then you plug them in here. And then the third is compartmental models. So in compartmental models, these are things like, you know, you've seen these curves before of cases, deaths, recoveries. And the most common one is the SIR model. So some of you might've heard about this. Um, this type of model is based on differential equations. It's sort of like the agent-based model, um, except uh, it's, a, it's an approximation of it. Um, and the way that you do that is you set up like, you know, people start off as susceptible, then they become infected um, at some rate. So the rate at which people become infected is, you know, proportional to some constant B times the number of people that are currently infected. Um, and so then, you know, you propagate those differential equations uh, to try and see what these curves look like. And then you do that a million times to try and see what the confidence is around those estimates. So that's how people are doing it. But ultimately, you know, these models, they're not going to tell you anything about a few months from now. I mean, they might give you sort of intuitive ideas that, oh, you know, if R0 is large, then the number of cases is going to increase. And if the number of cases increases, then a lot of people are going to die. That's what you should learn from those. But for the one to two week estimates, these, I think these generalized linear models are pretty good. Um, and they're going to work, you know, reasonably well for short time scales. All of these inherit, by the way, the data set problems that we talked about before. So unless you have a good CFR or R0 estimate from your data on which you fit your generalized linear model, then these things are going to inherit those problems. One last question, and this person thanks you for your excellent presentation. Uh, do you know of estimated probabilities of acquiring COVID-19 from exposure that is based on the physics of aerosolized virus particles? And how would the six foot physical distancing recommendation for a nominal 10 minute exposure be altered with that estimate? So, you know, I'm not a physicist and I don't think about, you know, too many physics things in my um, research, but I can tell you this. I can tell you that that probability uh, is actually the exact same conditional probability that we talked about, you know, in this chart that I presented. So I'm going to pull it up here. Um, so you can see my presentation now. Where is this chart? So that's exactly this conditional probability, this one right here. And, um, you know, you can talk about the physics of aerosolized particles, but the issue is that there is, you know, five or 10 biases that actually affect that conditional probability of, um, let's say, being susceptible to going to being exposed or being exposed to going to get sick. And those include how much social distancing you have and whether, whether you're up, what, you know, what your occupation is or how many people you're surrounded by. So there's this idea of viral load that I'm sure you've heard of. Viral load is, you know, if someone sneezes and you inhale one virus particle, then you're probably going to be okay. But there's some, you know, quantity of that virus in grams that if you inhale it, then you're probably going to get sick. So there's a, there's a probability distribution on that. But, you know, 50% of people will get sick if they inhale this much of the virus. And so the goal is to decrease that. Um, and so these, these measures like social distancing and masks, they're all meant basically to decrease your viral load. And you can think about it as like, you know, it's not just from one interaction that you might get sick, but it's an integral over many interactions. So you interact with one person, you get a small amount of the virus, but not enough to actually get you sick. But if you interact with 50, you know, if you go to a protest and there's a whole cloud of virus, for example, then, you know, you might have a higher chance of getting infected, which is why everybody should be wearing masks. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, basically, I think the, the answer to that question. Well, thank you so much, Anastasios, uh, for your remarkably brilliant presentation. Um, and my colleague, Professor Malik, is also here, and Professor Small, Kai Small, and Professor Mary Christianakis. So if you could all please come back on the screen uh, to say goodbye to folks who uh, are joining. This is the CTSJ department, the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice. And we are just honored to have you on today. That was really insightful, thank you.
Thank you. I really appreciate and, it. Thanks um, for inviting me. What we'll me. do is we'll put the video um, up for the previous talks in this talk um, up on the oxy.edu slash matrix website in addition to the link to um, Anastasios' uh, website. Um, and when we get Q&A follow-up for in, when that happens, uh, we got through a lot of questions this time, we'll also link that information on that website. So you can always come back, follow up on the webinars that you saw, um, as well as register for future uh, at oxy.edu slash matrix. We'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.